evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson. Tonight, if you want to understand a country's military, take a look at what its officer corps is reading. Military officers aren't just war fighters, they're trained to be thinkers, even intellectuals. Some of them have advanced degrees. In Russia, officers above the rank of colonel are required to read a book by a Russian nationalist called Alexander Dugin called The Foundations of Geopolitics. Dugan's book envisions a Eurasian empire with Russia at the center of it and then outlines a way to achieve that. In China, meanwhile, recruits are told to read The Origin and Goal of History. It teaches that China is successful because its culture is superior to the West's. Now, you might not agree with them, but these are serious books and they promote the national interests of the countries whose officers read them. That's why they're assigned. And that makes sense. So with that in mind, what are American military officers reading these days? Well, let's see a subliterate pamphlet on how the United States is a disgusting, immoral country that must be changed immediately and forever. That tract is entitled How to Be an Anti-Racist. It is written by a former University of Florida professor called Henry Rogers, who now that he is rich and famous, goes by his revolutionary name, Ibram X. Kendi. The book is garbage. Actually, it's worse than that. Not only is it embarrassingly stupid, it is poisonous. Kendi's premise is as simple as he is. Any system that produces unequal outcomes must be racist, period. That's it. That's the entire thesis. And Kendi applies it to everything. If some people make more money than other people, then the economy is racist. If Ibram X. Kendi decides there aren't enough black astrophysicists, then astrophysics is, by definition, racist. If it rains in a black neighborhood but not across town, then what you're watching is weather racism. Actually, Kennedy didn't really write that, probably because he has no detectable sense of humor. But there's no question that he believes it. The book is that militantly dumb. So how do we respond to all of this racism in the United States? Well, Kennedy provides a solution. Quote, the only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. He actually wrote that. In other words, his book against racism promotes racism. Now, you'd think that might be a red flag for people, contradicting as it does the founding principles of the country as well as basic human decency, but no. The people in charge love the book. It's all over corporate America. You can probably pick up a free copy at your HR department tomorrow morning if you want. But the military? It, you can't imagine the U.S. military would assign a book like that, recommended to every sailor in the U.S. Navy. Well, yes, actually. On Tuesday, Congressman Jim Banks of Indiana demanded an explanation for this from the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Michael Gilday. Here's how it went. Kendi's book states that capitalism is essentially racist. And Kendi is clear that racism must be eliminated. So yes or no? Do you personally consider advocating for the destruction of American capitalism to be extremist? Here's what I know, Congressman. So yes There's or no racism question, Admiral. in the United States Navy. Admiral, you I recommended every sailor in the United States Navy read this book. So yes or no question. I'm not forcing anybody to read the book. It's on a recommended reading list. Admiral, did you read the book? I did. Admiral, you said you read this book. What part of this book is redeeming and, and qualifies as something that, that every, I think every sailor in the United States needs to read it. I think he's critical about his own journey as an African-American in this country, what he's experienced. Let me ask you again, Admiral, do you expect that sa after sailors read this book that says that the United States Navy is racist, that we will increase or decrease morale, cohesion, and recruiting race into the United States Navy? I think we'll be a better Navy from having open, honest conversations about racism. Open and honest conversations about racism. Well, that would be nice. But it's an amusing line coming from someone who claims to have read Kendi's book, as Gilday says he has. Open and honest conversations are racist. Kendi said that many times. So let's say, open and honestly, you decided that you cared more about the way people behave than the way that they look. Let's say you took a Martin Luther King at his word and judged people by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. If you were to do that, Ibram X. Kendi says you were a racist. Quote, the claim of not racist neutrality is a mask for racism. The language of colorblindness is a mask to hide racism. A colorblind constitution for a white supremacist America. That's the military's reading. So no, open and honest conversations are not allowed in Kendi's America. Here's the choice. You admit you're a racist or else you're a super duper racist. That's his position. It sounds pretty deranged, honestly. 
In fact, it sounds like an extremist ideology, just the kind the military is always warning us about. Keep in mind that tonight, right now, the Pentagon is investigating National Guardsmen who have posted unfashionable opinions on Facebook about the last election or may have voted for Donald Trump. So with all their investigators running around looking into people's thought crimes, how closely have they looked, has the Pentagon looked, into Ibram X. Kendi? Have they checked his social media history? Well, actually, Congressman Banks asked Gilday that question. Watch. In college, Kendi stated that white people are a different breed of humans and are responsible for the AIDS virus. Yes or no, do you personally consider the conspiracy that white people started AIDS to be an extremist belief? Sir, I'd have to understand the context. That is a simple statements question. Are made. I'm not going to I'm not going to Admiral, here. this is a book I'm that you recommended here, sir, every defend, sailor in the United defend, States Navy cherry read. picked quotes from somebody's book. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> do you consider the statement that white people created AIDS an extremist statement? I can't comment on that. <laughs> I need the context for that. So Admiral Gilday, what a mediocrity, will not defend the man he's just been promoting to the entire U.S. Navy. Now that's odd, though once you dig a little, you can see why he doesn't want to talk much about it. Not long ago, Kendi was invited to speak at the Aspen Ideas Festival, a place where ideas go to die. A room full of academics waited to hear his wisdom. During the question and answer session, one of them dared to ask the most basic question of all. How are we defining racism? How do you define it? Now, you'd think Ibram X. Kendi would be ready for that question, but he wasn't. Here's what he said. You talked about the importance of defining racism, but, I, but I, unless I missed it, which is possible, I didn't, I didn't hear your personal definition. Is there, is there one that you would offer us? Like, how do you define racism? Sure. So racism, I would define it um, as a collection uh, of racist policies that lead to racial inequity that are substantiated by racist ideas. Can you say that again? <laughs> sure. A, a collection uh, of racist policies that lead to racial inequity that are substantiated by racist ideas. <laughs> so racism is racist stuff. Or as Kendi puts it, and we're quoting now, it's a collection of racist policies that lead to racial inequity that are substantiated by racist ideas, end quote. Right. But how are we defining racism? Ibram X. Kendi couldn't say. Despite making a bountiful living on the topic, getting rich, talking about racism, he hadn't thought how to define the word. Now, in a serious society, everybody listening, everyone in the room would have walked out and found something better to do. Bird watching, maybe. That's racist. Well, the so-called intellectual on stage turned out to be an idiot. So they should have left. But they didn't. They just laughed nervously. They were worried that they said something about what had just happened. If they pointed out that the former Henry Rogers is, in fact, a fraud, they would be denounced as well. This is how mediocre people control entire societies with implied threats. Go along or we'll punish you. So they don't say anything. The funny thing is, in his own book, Kendi admits that he himself is a racist. Here's a definition. Quote, white Democrats stood aside and let Bush steal the presidency on the strength of destroyed black votes. Bush's team transitioned that winter. I transitioned into hating white people. White people became devils to me, but I had to figure out how they came to be devils. So this is the man that Admiral Michael Gilday, it's hard to believe that Admiral Michael Gilday has any power in the United States military, but he does. And this is the man Admiral Michael Gilday believes the entire U.S. Navy should study. Imagine working for someone like Admiral Michael Gilday. Most normal people cannot even imagine that, so they're leaving the military. One Marine told us that military, a military history training session was replaced with mandatory training on police brutality, white privilege, and systemic racism. He reported that several officers are now leaving his unit citing that training. Another service member told us that their unit was required to read White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo, which claims, and this is a quote, white people raised in Western society are conditioned into a white supremacist worldview. An airman told us their unit was forced into a racist exercise called a privilege walk, where members of the wing were ordered to separate themselves by race and gender in order to stratify people based on their perceived privilege. It's 
depressing if you think about it. Good people driven from military service, many of them serving generationally because their fathers and grandfathers did, but having to leave now purely because of the extremist ideology of its leaders. It's crushing if you think about it. But it's also scary for all of us. We need the military. The Pentagon is in the Department of Education. It's not the DMV. We have to have it. It's essential to the survival of the country. But the commissars in the Biden administration don't care. They're not slowing down. They are intensifying the political purge in the ranks. NASA just announced its new mission has nothing to do with space. The new mission is about applying the principles in Ibrahim Kendi's book. The new mission is equity. Of equity. Are you going to join the mission of equity? Can you define it? Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Lohmeyer can define it. He knows what that mission looks like. He was a commander in the Space Force. He was then fired for speaking out against the open political indoctrination that he saw there. He's the author of the book Irresistible Revolution, Marxism's Goal of Conquest and the Unmaking of the American Military. Colonel Lohmeyer joins us tonight. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, thanks so much for coming on. So NASA, you would think, would be the one branch agency that would be immune from the equity mission. Were you, I mean, you served in the U.S. government for a long time. Were you under the impression that NASA had a problem with discrimination in years past? Yeah, I don't know. Tucker, thanks, first off, for having me on your show. Uh, and as always, I don't speak for the Defense Department, but speak for right. myself. Um, you know, I'm, I don't think that any of our institutions at this point are immune from this idea that we're going to be pursuing equity. Uh, clearly, these are hot topics, uh, the, the talking point of the day. In fact, I do want to define it for the American people. You, you mentioned, I know the definition of equity. Uh, it's important for the American people to understand the difference between equity and equality. One of them is good and the ideal, and the other is not good. Uh, we tend to confuse at the moment equality of opportunity, which is the ideal and is something that's a part of America's founding uh, philosophy, with equity. It's a new, it's a new term. It's, it's used wittingly, which essentially means enforced outcomes or enforced inequality. In fact, based on what I've seen uh, in the Department of Defense and now what I'm hearing is permeating institutions across uh, the country, it's essentially even potentially uh, illegally discriminatory uh, policy. Uh, equity is not good as it is defined, but it sounds good and that's why we use the word. But NASA has historically been, uh, I think, a symbol of inclusion and equal opportunity. Uh, yes. NASA is the kind of an organization that people can look at and understand that regardless of your background, you're able to show up here, just like in the Defense Department, and rise up based on your merit and have an opportunity to make a name for yourself, to rise to leadership, and actually do very important things for the country. Because there's a unifying mission uh, that these institutions uh, believe in, whether it's space exploration, in the case of NASA, or uh, defending uh, our, our country and our, our allies from serious threats that we have in the world. People in uniform, for example, rally around that mission and yes. have historically not been caught up in the kind of identity politicking that you're talking about and that I'm hearing uh, in your monologue. And so I'll just make one point to say that I think our senior leaders and our national leaders need to think very carefully about whether or not they want to inject tribalism into our, our long trusted institutions in this country that typically have not been infected with tribal thinking with all that that uh, entails. Do we really want to walk the road that will cause us to abandon Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, dream right. of having a colorless society where, in fact, we're starting once again to judge people in, by the color of their skin, impugning guilt to other groups of people based on their group identity, not because of anything that they've ever done necessarily themselves, but based on who they are, accidentally even, let's say. Uh, that is a good definition of racism. We don't impugn guilt to people based on the color of their skin. No, and we never should. And I always imagined that the military was the shining beacon of what the rest of the country should be because it was a colorblind meritocracy in there. So I think this threatens all of us. Um, Lieutenant yeah, Colonel in fact, the, the, mil the military is great at that, Tucker, and uh, that's why so many people are upset about what they're hearing. Yeah, and they have every reason to be. I know that you are.
Thank you. Thank you for speaking out and for coming on tonight. Appreciate Thank it. you. Well, there's been an enormous amount of hyperventilating in Washington over a segment we did two nights ago in which we pointed out that there were pretty clearly a number of people in the crowd at the Capitol on January 6th who had been in previous contact with the FBI about what was going to happen that day. Some of them may have encouraged others at the scene to commit crimes. Now, if that happened, and we believe it did happen, it would not be out of character for the FBI. They've done things very much like that before. That is beyond dispute. But in this case, they are disputing it, not the FBI directly. They haven't said a word. But the obedient minions of the national security state who run the social media accounts of the New York Times and occupy the anchor desks at CNN. They became hysterical when we mentioned it. You can't say that, they screamed. That's not allowed. The geniuses at Twitter weighed in to inform us that the people we had described as agents of the FBI were, in fact, just FBI informants. So shut up. Hilarious. But we won't shut up, and we shouldn't. It could not be more obvious at this point that the government is, in fact, hiding something, probably quite a few things. So best to abandon the theatrics and find out what they are hiding. That's our job. To many in corporate media who claim that we are spreading Russian disinformation, instead, please calmly answer these three questions. First, how many of the so-called insurrectionists on January 6th had a relationship with the FBI? How many of these FBI moles encouraged others that day to break the law at the Capitol? We haven't heard anyone answer these questions or even address them. If the answer is none, if none of the protesters were secretly working with the FBI that day, then we were wrong. And we will apologize for it sincerely. We'll admit it immediately. But if the answer is not none, and we're pretty sure it isn't none, then people who claim otherwise are liars and hacks and should leave the public stage immediately because they have betrayed their readers and viewers. Two, if the Justice Department knew there were going to be protesters massing at the Capitol that day, and it's clear they did know, then why didn't they do anything to stop the riot? Why did police at the Capitol allow protesters to walk in, as video shows that they did? That doesn't make sense. What's going on here? Why is no one asking that question? Third and finally, why can't we see the tape for ourselves? The government is hiding more than 14,000 hours of video surveillance tape that shows exactly what did happen at the Capitol that day. Why are they hiding that? And why aren't news organizations demanding to see it? You'd hate to think that NBC News, for example, or Vox, or The Atlantic, or The Washington Post, or The Daily Beast, or The New York Times, or any of them, are in fact working to protect the regime at the expense of the public. But unfortunately, we are starting to conclude that. Please prove us wrong. Well, a new lawsuit suggests that Twitter has been conspiring with the state of California to censor posts about election fraud. The people behind that lawsuit will share the evidence they have gathered in it. That's next. The Judicial Watch showed that the Secretary of State of the state of California worked with a Democratic Party PR firm to direct Twitter, the media monopoly, to censor users who suggested that election fraud might be real. A new lawsuit says that the state of California's coordinated censorship with Twitter violates the First Amendment, which obviously it does. Harmeet Dillon is a lawyer with the Center for American Liberty and one of the country's most important First Amendment advocates. Rogan O'Hanley is an activist and attorney. He's one of the users who was censored and is suing Twitter and the state. Harmeet and Rogan join us to explain. Thanks both of you uh, for coming on. Harmeet, give us the overview if you would, of, of what they did. Sure. Well, a lot of us who use Twitter and other social media have suspected that this has been going on for some time, but the Judicial Watch uh, Public Records Act request documents reveal a stunning and broad conspiracy by government agencies, uh, Democrat lobbying firms, and a national association of secretaries of state to gather so-called dangerous election-related speech, work with Twitter and potentially other social media companies, and get that speech taken down in the name of fairer and cleaner elections. Our client, Rogan O'Handley, was caught up in this dragnet for perfectly legitimate and honest opinions and commentary about seeking audits about these elections. And in retaliation for that, he was removed from the Twitter platform. This is a violation of the First Amendment. It's a civil rights conspiracy. It also violates the California Constitution. And I think once we start getting into discovery in this case, we're going to find out that this is a lot more widespread than just what happened to Rogan. 
Yeah, I mean, this is a textbook violation of the First Amendment in that the government is conspiring to deprive citizens of their speech. R Rogan, tell us this, the speech that you were deprived of, if you would. Well, I used to be a Hollywood entertainment lawyer before I got sick of the double standards, the hypocrisy, and especially the corruption in our federal government. So I left that entire legal career behind to fight for you know liberty and justice for all on social media. And it, after the election, I am a trained lawyer. I look at evidence. I look at videos. I read sworn affidavits, and I said, we need investigations here. I called for the same things that Stacey Abrams called for when she refused to concede the Georgia gubernatorial election. I said, we need to look into this further. And then specifically, I said, we need to look at it in California. I used to live there. I know how flimsy those elections can be. And so I said, hey, let's look at California elections. And then Alex P Dia, Secretary of State, it was a criticism of his actions in office, and then he paid this firm, SKDK, to tell him who to censor. That was me. So, so a politician, I mean, this is even clearer cut than I realized at the outset. A politician says, someone's criticizing me, shut him down. Well, Absolutely. Yeah, and. <laughs> If I can add, this politician was auditioning for the role of United States Senator. That's very critical as well. He was hoping that if Kamala Harris was named the United States Vice President, he would be named by the governor to fill that role. And that's exactly what happened. So he was actually elbowing out of the way other Democrats. And this this whole contract for $35 million for who to censor was is so corrupt that other Democrats in the state protested about it because it was a no-bid contract given to a consultant for the Biden campaign. SKD Knickerbocker is a Biden campaign consultant. So this is a mess of conflicts of interest, cons conspiracy, and boondoggle and favor trading. That is totally third world. So, Rogan, do, have you gotten a full picture of the censorship against you? Yeah, I mean, I run various accounts across social media. I have millions of followers, which I'm very thankful for, because I tell the truth and I call out corruption in our government. That's what people want. They want real talk. And, you know, this situation feels like David versus Goliath. I don't work for anyone. I'm completely independent, but I'm going to take on this machine. I'm going to take on corrupt California government. I'm going to take on the Biden administration because, you know what, one of the head honchos at SKDK, Anita Dunn, now works as a special advisor to the Joe Biden White House. This goes all the way to the top, and we're going after him. God bless you for doing that, and, and good luck, for sure. Harmeet Rogan, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Tucker. Thank you, Tucker. So there's a war going on just south of our border. No one ever says it, but it's true. Tonight, there's been a major discovery of Mexican cartel activity on the American side of the border. That was inevitable. It's horrifying. We've got exclusive reporting on it next. So really, this is on Kamala Harris. She's the border czar. The funny thing is she doesn't seem that interested in actually going to the border. When her friends at NBC News asked why she hadn't gone there, bothered to, Harris didn't really have a coherent answer. Do you have any plans? to visit the border. I, at some point, you know, I, we are going to the border. We've been to the border. So you, this whole this whole this whole thing about the border, we've been to the border. We've been to the border. You haven't been to the border. I, and I haven't been to Europe. And I, I mean, I don't I don't understand the point that you're making. Well, maybe the point he was making is if you're in charge of it, maybe you should go see it if only for symbolic reasons, to show that you're interested. That was June 8th. As of today, Harris has still not gone. Why is that? Victor Davis Hansen is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. He joins us. Now, Professor, thanks so much for coming on. Is this significant that she hasn't Thank gone? You. Yeah, it's a lose-lose situation for her, Tucker, because the optics are all bad. The left in general, I think, believes in open borders. They're citizens of the world. They don't believe in sovereignty. And in particular, they look at uh, massive illegal, illegal immigration from Mexico and Central America, especially when people are poor, they don't know English, they're illegal. They become wards of the state and federal government when they arrive, and then the, the left says, we hand you these entitlements and we expect fealties at the polls. And it works out pretty well. They flip California. They flip Nevada, they flip New Mexico, they probably have flipped Colorado, maybe 
uh, Arizona, who knows, Texas and Georgia. So they're committed to this policy. The only thing that, if I could use the vernacular, screwed up, they were expecting 500 to 1,000 a day, maybe a half a million a year. They didn't think in the fiscal year we're going to get 2 million people. And that means bad optics. All the things they demagogue, Tucker, unaccompanied adults, gang members, cages, cartels, now they're happening in spades. And so they don't know what to do. They like the idea that there's these mass influx. They just didn't think, they thought the media could put a handle on it, but it's so huge they can't. So they send Kamala Harris down there. And I think they do it in a very cynical fashion. I think that a lot, they believe a lot of leaks about Joe Biden's cognitive abilities emanate from the vice president's office. They know it's, as I said, it's a toxic political situation because they, it's self-created and whatever she says is going to have as much negative as positive appeal. She's That's not right. going to go down there and I think she's probably seen it. It's kind of like being gasoline czar right now. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not an enviable task and I think she knows it and she's saying to them, I'm not going to go near there. And uh, you, can, you can see why. I think that's really smart. It was an act of passive aggression to hand this to Kamala Harris. <laughs> now you're making me appreciate the Biden people a little more. <laughs> Thank you, Victor Davis Hanson. Good Except, to see you. Yeah, we're, we're, we're sort of the victims of the cynicism. We, are, Of course we are. Of course we are. But the fact that yeah. she's suffering a little bit, yeah. too, Thank you know, you. it's a mitigating factor. Good to yeah. see you. Thanks. So we've got a team of documentary makers on the border right now for our Tucker Carlson original series. That episode will debut later this summer. You can see it on foxnation.com. So all of a sudden, it's pretty hard to get your book published if you've got the wrong political views. That's censorship. Simon & Schuster has led the way on that, but they're not the only ones. Now there is an option, a new publishing house dedicated to the principle of freedom of speech. Well, in January, Simon & Schuster, the gargantuan publishing house, canceled a book by a senator from Missouri, Josh Hawley, because a mob of Democratic activists told them to. It wasn't the first time they'd done something like this. They did the same thing to Milo Yiannopoulos several years before. They neglected to take a second book from best-selling author Candace Owens because they didn't like her politics. Simon & Schuster did that. It's all in a new book that I have just written, coming out in August, published by Simon & Schuster which you might want to check out. But in the meantime, in the face of this kind of censorship, this digital book burning, there is a new option in publishing that we want to tell you about tonight. It's called All Seasons Press. Louise Burke is the co-founder. She used to work at Simon Schuster and the publisher. Kate Hartson is the co-founder and editor-in-chief. Together, they will offer this option to the country. Louise and Kate, congratulations. Thank you for coming on tonight. We appreciate it. Um, so, Thank you, Tucker. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Louise. Why does the country need this? We created, a for, we created All Seasons Press to prevent the silencing of opposing thoughts. We are yeah. fed up with this administration, the media, and big tech telling us what to think and how to think, and at the same time indoctrinating our children in school. They are going attacking our language, and our basic right of free speech, and they're coming for everyone. Well, I think you're absolutely right about that. So, Kate, how will All Seasons Press be different from, say, a Simon & Schuster imprint? Well, as, as Louise said, I mean, we are, we are here for um, all points of view. We support the conservative message, and they're trying to silence that message. We feel there's a real void. Now that because publishers, although they're publishing some conservative books, they're only publishing those that they feel um, don't, in, don't um, approach subjects that are considered taboo. And That's right. so there's all the, of this selection going on. And, you know, we're here to support the senators, the great thinkers, pundits, voices who we've published before who are now being ignored, they're being canceled, they're being censored, and so we felt that we, there's really room for us and, and a void to be filled. Well, there certainly is a void. I mean, Louise, you've sp you spent many, many years in publishing. So Candace Owens, one of the biggest names in publishing, her first book was just a runaway success. Her second book was guaranteed to be Simon & Schuster could have taken it. John Carp, who runs it, said, I don't want it, purely for political reasons. So. The sense that I'm getting is their politics are more important than their revenue. That's how ideological they are. 
Well, I also think that the people who work at the publishing houses are trying to dictate what the publishing houses do. It's a business, first and foremost, and the woke books that they would like to publish are funded by some of these bigger books that we're talking about. So right. um, there's a little education to be done there. Wait, so you're and saying that you when know, they the, publish uh, a conservative book that people actually read, it pays for the little boutique crazy projects that the lunatics who work there would like to see in print? <laughs> I would say that the smaller books absolutely are funded by the bigger books and you don't have to buy the book, you don't have to read the book. It's America. You can choose not to. But are right. we not to publish the voices, for instance, of politicians who are only in sound bites? They should have the long form. They should have exactly. the right to do so. Yeah, I think I mean, you're exactly right. The Times right. reported today that... I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, Kate. You so said the Times reported today that there are um, uh, some publishing executives are saying that it would be morally unacceptable to publish books by Trump administration officials. Yeah. And we find a statement like that is crazy and completely unacceptable to us. And we're proudly, in our first list, we're proudly publishing two high-level Trump administration officials, Mark Meadows and Peter Navarro. Yeah, well, good for you. And, and shame on them for abandoning the long-standing commitment that American publishing had to freedom of speech. They've given it up completely. And it's disgusting. Louise and Kate, congrats. I appreciate it. So it looks like former Lincoln Project staffers have found new employment. You'll never guess where. We'll give you one hint. They're still screaming about Russia. That's next.